Good afternoon, everybody. A um, little bit of background. The evolution of the animal welfare movement, I've watched a whole bunch of it happen over the last 35 years since I staggered into my first animal shelter. Um, by way of background, I got a degree in animal science from the University of Tennessee at, in Knoxville, and I stumbled into an animal shelter fresh out of school with no real clue what I was going to do and ended up um, becoming their shelter manager. I really and truly believe the only reason they hired me for that job was because they couldn't find anybody else willing to work that cheap. Um, I don't think it's because I was eminently qualified. I'd love to think it was because I'm this highly educated, brilliant person, but I think it was really just that I had very low standards when it came to salary and benefits. So at, at any rate, I, I stumbled in there and, and I, I was handed a set of keys and I was introduced to the staff. I was probably the youngest person on that staff at that time and all of a sudden I'm, I'm their boss and I had no idea how to be anybody's boss. Um, so it was, it was a real learning experience for me and, and for the people that I worked with way back then. But just to give you a, a little history on, on that shelter, because I think it tells you a whole lot about how far we have evolved in, in a relatively short time. I mean, if you think about it, 35 years in the scheme of the universe is really not a long period of time. And usually to make major social change takes a whole lot longer than that. And we have made incredible strides in a really short period of time. At that first animal shelter, um, which was a, a humane society that had government contracts to provide sheltering. We didn't do the field services work, but we did provide the sheltering for all the animals that were picked up by animal control. And we, uh, we were handling in a building that was about, I'm going to be really generous and say that building was 4,500 square feet. Um, so it was a big suburban house, basically. But it was not anything like a big suburban house. It was a 35-year-old building that had been built as a county maintenance garage, was never intended to be an animal shelter. It had been retrofit and retrofit over the years into uh, a, a sort of makeshift animal shelter. The building was literally falling down around us. And through that little building, with a very tiny staff made up of fewer than a dozen people, we were handling 14,000 animals a year. So when you think about where, where you are now and where the, the, the whole field and the whole world and our communities are now, that's, it's hard for you to probably even get your arms around that. How many folks have been in this for longer than 10 years? So very few, very few. Congratulations for surviving it for that long. Um, so, for, you know, that's the thing. Folks coming in don't have that background. You didn't see that. You didn't see what we dealt with and what we lived through to get us to the point that we're at now. And, and, and one of the things I find really frustrating in our industry is when I read articles by people who talk about all, you know, the, 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 the horrible things that are happening in the world now. And I think, good Lord, where were you 35 years ago when we were euthanizing 12,000 animals a year in one little county facility um, in, in eastern Tennessee? We, you know, we, it was trial by fire back then. It was, we, we, we literally survived it. We didn't thrive, but we survived. And what, that's really, I think, what has driven us to make all the major improvements in the industry. You'll hear people say, well, you know, it's because I, I kick and scream and I've made my county do better things. No, what really has motivated those of us who have stuck it out for a really long time is the fact that we had our eye on this prize a long time ago. When I walked into that facility 35 years ago, fresh out of college, not having a clue what, what my future was going to look like, I can promise you that I never walked in there with the intention that I loved euthanizing animals and couldn't wait to continue doing it for the rest of my life. That was never part of my master plan, and I've never met the person who did have that as part of their master plan. I hear about him a lot. I hear, about, I, hear, I hear about that vampire in the back of the shelter who just loves killing dogs and cats and, and can't wait to get back at it the next day. But I can tell you that it, was that it was that mass euthanasia and that incredible public apathy around what we were having to do that drove me to continue doing it. I, when I first walked in, I thought, well, I'll do this for about six months and then I'll find a real job. Well, that literally was 35 years ago, and, and I'm still trying really hard to plug away at it and, and make things better for animals and for people and for communities as a whole. I think that's really what, we're all, what we are all about and what we should be all about. So 
I, I did some other stints. I did a four-year stint with the, with the HSUS. I ran a regional office out of Tennessee covering four states, which my friends in the DC office used to lovingly refer to as the redneck regional office. <laughs> Um, but we got a lot of stuff done in those four difficult states. Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia are not, were not back then the most progressive places to do animal welfare work. But we struggled and fought and kicked and screamed and, and got some stuff done in spite of it. Um, so I spent some time there. I spent some time running a shelter in um, Louisiana, the Louisiana SPCA in New Orleans. That's a, there, there's, there's a, if, if, if you've never spent any time in New Orleans, and you, you wouldn't really appreciate that, but imagine doing animal welfare work. Imagine trying to encourage people to take better care of their puppies in an environment where they're killing each other in record numbers. We had 400 murders in the city of New Orleans the last year I lived there, and I'm trying to get people to hug their puppies a little tighter. So it was a really rough place to get anything done. But even there, we chipped away and we made, we made headway. It's all, you know, it seems like we're always kind of fighting the odds, but, but we've got to keep fighting nonetheless. Left New Orleans and went to a place called Lollipop Farm, um, which many of you are probably familiar with in Rochester. And I didn't know where Rochester, New York was on the map. <laughs> when they recruited me, I'm like, I had literally had to go get a map and look it up. And, and then when I realized that it was actually the southern part of Canada, um, I thought, well, I suppose I could give this a try. I will probably die of exposure the first year that I live there, but I'll give it a go. So we loaded up our covered wagon and headed north, and, and uh, my children thought that, they had, that, that, that the life was pretty much over. And, and then about six months later, the sun came out one day. And no, it was actually, I had a lovely experience. I loved, I loved pretty much every minute of my time there. We, we, we raised a bunch of money and built a brand new, wonderful facility. We, tore, we, we were talking beforehand, I, we tore down a facility that was way nicer than the one I left in Louisiana um, and replaced it with one that was even better and, and made major, major strides. And, you know, interestingly, I think about my beginning when we were, we, we, I, I got into animal welfare about the same time that Parvo became a thing in the world. And so we'd come into the shelter in the morning and find litters of puppies that were perfectly healthy at seven o'clock the night before, and the next morning they're dead in their, in their runs because of parvo. So I went from that to a, and, and a place where we were taking in litter after litter after litter of puppies. It was not unusual at that first shelter for us to take in 150 animals in an, in an afternoon in the summertime. And we didn't have, the whole shelter couldn't hold that many animals, so we were turning animals over like you wouldn't believe. And then, I, and then we built a shelter in upstate New York and we, we put three puppy kennels in the entire facility and they never had puppies in them. They always had bunnies or pot belly pigs or some, some other craziness because we didn't have puppies. And when we got them, we had people fighting in the aisles wanting, I, I used to joke that even ugly puppies have a line of people waiting to adopt. And then you have that person who's like, there's no such thing as an ugly puppy. And I'm like, oh, but yes, there are ugly puppies. <laughs> Just like they're ugly babies, we all know it. We never admit it, but, but there are definitely some homely babies in the world. So what I want to talk about a little bit today is just sort of going, how, how we got from there to here, and then kind of what I see as the, the, the big challenges that are still facing us in the, at least the next little bit of the future. I don't know what things are going to look like 35 years from now. Hopefully I'll be either retired or dead or both by then. So, um, but... Uh, you know, I, I, do, I do have some ideas about what I think, where, where, what our next big steps are going to be in order to continue making the kind of rapid fire improvement that we've made for, uh, for animals and for communities. So let's, uh, let's dive right into this bad boy. So I have always been a big proponent of being willing to try new stuff. I think if we, if we don't, if we stop changing then we're, we're going get, to get stagnant really, really quickly. So we've got to be open to new ideas and new attitudes and ways to change the way we do business. If we continue doing everything exactly the way I did it when I first stumbled in 35 years ago, we're not going to make very quick progress. So we've got to be open to new ways of looking at things. So I, I love this Charles Darwin quote. It's not the strongest of the species that survived, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. So I think that's that we, we sort of have to frame this whole conversation that way, that, that we have to be open to, uh, to, to new ideas and new ways of, of thinking and doing stuff. 
I now run an organization called the Association for Animal Welfare Advancement. It used to be the Society of Animal Welfare Administrators, or SAWA. You may have heard of us. You may not have, which is kind of scary because we're a 48-year-old organization. But uh, I, one thing I've learned since I took this job three years ago is that we are, in many circles, we're still one of the best kept secrets in animal welfare. So we're going to do something to change all of that. We're basically a professional association made up of leaders in the industry, leaders and folks who aspire to be leaders in the industry. The idea is that at some point, people like me are going to be too old and tired to do this anymore. And we need to be replacing ourselves with people who are, are, are younger and smarter and more energetic and more enthusiastic. So we're constantly looking to do training and professional development work to really bring those people along in their careers. So I'll do a sales pitch at the end of this and make sure that you all sign up. The back door is locked officially now. <laughs> and I will have Guido sitting right outside this door to sign you up if you're not already a member of ours. So if you think that what we do is, is kind of small potatoes, I think it's really, and, the, and these numbers are a couple of years old now, but. But I think it does kind of give you an idea. I think it's really important sometimes for us to look at the numbers and really think about how, how big of an industry we actually represent. This is not mom and pop stuff anymore, right? Some of our organizations may still, still feel a little mom and pop, but we're not mom and pop at all anymore. When you think about six to eight million dogs are still entering shelters, I mean, that's down from when I got into this thing. Back when I got into it 35 years ago, the estimates were, any, and, and, and it's funny because they are just estimates, but the estimates range from 9 to 13 million animals a year coming into shelters 35 years ago. Now we're at 6 to 8 million, 4 million cats and dogs adopted from shelters every year, so, which, which if you do the math, right now the estimate is there are probably about a million and a half dogs and cats being euthanized in shelters now, as opposed to 10 million back when I was in this business as a newbie. So we've, we've made major headway, but it's still too many. A million and a half is still a lot of dogs and cats. So we still have work ahead of us. Two and a half billion dollars are spent by humane organizations alone a year. So we are a force in the economy in addition to being a force for good in our communities. 800 million to a billion dollars are spent by animal control organizations annually just to, to keep people and animals in the streets safe. So I want to talk a little bit about trends, some of the trends that I've seen and continue to see. I'm, I have an advantage because being in a national organization, I, we've got members from all over the country and several from outside the country. And so we're able to, we're <laughs> an advocate for Canada up here. And, uh, so, <laughs> thank you. So as a result, we, we're, I'm able to kind of keep a little bit of a finger on the pulse of what's happening kind of big picture wise. It's really challenging when you're in the shelter world or the rescue world. It's, it can be kind of challenging to, to, to really keep your eye on that bigger picture. We're so focused on what we're dealing with in our own little community, our own little corner of the world. And, and it, sometimes it feels kind of overwhelming. Um, and so you don't really stop and think about these big trends. So I'm in, a, I'm in a position where I can actually look at some of this stuff. So one of the things that we are seeing kind of across the board, although I'm going to give you a disclaimer, is fewer incoming animals in general. Not in all communities. And if you look at certain parts of the country, you get down to the deep south where I've spent most of my time, and those shelters are still struggling. They're still dealing with major overpopulation. They're, they're the ones who are really pr your primary source agencies when it comes to transport programs because they still have animals that are breeding at rapid fire and coming into the shelter in crazy numbers. So it's not everywhere, but, but on balance across the country, we are seeing those numbers decline a little bit. What that really does for us as animal welfareists is it frees up our time and our money. It frees up our resources in general to sort of do more, to take a deeper dive in helping the animals that we are dealing with, that we are seeing firsthand. So what that translates into is that because you're dealing with fewer animals, but typically a population of animals that are more difficult to place, so you're spending more money per animal. Um, so the, the, it's interesting, while we see the numbers of animals go down, the spend does not go down. Costs go up and then the cost per animal tends to go up. We're seeing this in incredible um, rate of transport of animals from places where they have where there's very little demand and a huge supply 
to places where there's very high demand and not much of a supply. Um, that's, I, I don't have to tell you all that. You're seeing it yourselves everywhere. You know, back in my sheltering days, we saw very, very little of that. And, and when it was done, it was often not done real well. Um, we, the very first load of, of puppies we took from a shelter in South Carolina when I was at Lollipop Farm, we, uh, we worked with these people on the phone for weeks and agreed to take a, a load of puppies. And the, the person who was spearheading it ran a little rescue organization in South Carolina. Her husband was the veterinarian in their community. And uh, they assured us these puppies had been in, kept in isolation. They'd been given the full complement of vaccinations. They'd been dewormed. They were this, they were that. They were perfectly healthy puppies. So we're like, well, heck, we, we don't have any puppies. There's a big demand up here for puppies, and we can save 30 or 40 lives right now in one trip if we accept these puppies. So we sort of took that leap of faith. They show up. They were supposed to have a climate-controlled van. They show up with a livestock trailer with no climate control full of sick puppies. So between Lollipop and Buffalo, we ended up having to euthanize the vast majority of those puppies because they had serious stuff, distemper and parvo kind of stuff. So back then, transport was just not, it was unprofessional and it was not very, it was not a very widespread life-saving tool in, in our industry at all. Nowadays, that has completely changed and we've realized, I had a friend who actually said to me, you know, the difference between life and death for these puppies in, in, in South Louisiana is a ride. And when you hear it put that simply, it's kind of like, well, then we got to give them a ride. <laughs> that, how hard is that? Let's give them a ride. So now we f have figured out ways in our association. Um, we, uh, we have a, a committee called Best Practices and Emerging Trends, and we're developing best practice documents in some of the key areas of the industry. And one of the very first ones we did was on transport of companion animals so that we're encouraging organizations to follow those best practices to make sure that every transport, that while the end result may be great, we want the whole process to be in the best interest of the animals and the people at both ends of, of the transport. So that's a big deal. Adoptable, that word adoptable, I don't know if anybody much still uses that, but it's a loaded term. It's always been a loaded term because adoptable really is whatever you can adopt. Right? I mean, if you can adopt a dog with, with cancer and who's 14 years old and has three legs and a skin condition, then that dog's adoptable. In most shelters, and certainly where I'm from, that animal would probably not be considered adoptable because they don't have the resources to fix all that stuff, all those things that are wrong, and they don't have a big audience of folks who are just lining up to adopt that dog. So that whole word adoptable seems to be changing. Animals back in my day, that in my early years in sheltering, that never would have been considered. If we got a dog hit by a car back then, that dog was, that was a dead dog. There was no hope for that dog. We had no money, we had no space, um, and we had plenty of other dogs coming in right behind him who were, were healthy and didn't need thousands of dollars invested in them. That's changed. That's, it's very different now. That, those dogs are often kind of put back together again, patched up and taken care of and put into therapeutic foster care or whatever until they're ready to be placed. So it's a, that, it's a pretty, that's a pretty cool trend in my book. Um, and then the puppy and kitten shortage is, is real in certain parts of the country. Um, and when, the first time I heard somebody at a shelter in Colorado tell me that they were importing cats for adoption, I, that's what I did. I actually laughed out loud. I'm like, are you kidding me? You, you guys don't have enough cats? What the hell? What are you doing? Like, is there some sort of plague that I don't know about in your country? But it, it was, they literally had a shortage. And so they're bringing in cats from all over the place now. So it, it's, it, it's a new world. It's, it's a whole new world. And, and, it's, and it's pretty awesome. Another trend is this sort of increase in, in the number of groups and organizations and, and individuals that, who call themselves organizations. And we all know that there are really amazing groups that call themselves rescue groups. There are also groups who just are groups of one crazy person with a website, right? <laughs> um, and, and we're going to talk about communication and the, the, the internet and social media in a little bit. But, but those are those people who can attack you in their mother's basement without ever having to come out of the darkness. Um, we, we all know who they are. But there are a lot of these groups that are phenomenally strong and good and passionate and who have amazing support from their own communities. 
And it, as long as they're willing to really work together with everybody else as part of a solution, then I, I say let's work with everybody. If, as long as everybody's getting along instead of attacking each other, which happens all too often, um, then, then I say let's go. Gives us a lot of collaboration opportunities. We're seeing so much more of that where organizations and communities are realizing that by combining forces and working together and reducing cost, if, you, if you've got four animal welfare organizations in one community fundamentally doing the same thing, and all four of them have got a management team and an executive director and insurance and all these other things, if they can combine all of that and be more efficient in the way they operate, then that's that much more money that can go towards the mission and making things better for the community as a whole. So I love collaboration. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. All these additional groups that have come um, on the scene in the last several years also can add to the confusion of the community. It, let's face it, there are a lot of folks in your community who have no idea what you do now. Right? Even when, you was, when it was just you, they didn't know what you did. Now that it's you and 15 other organizations in the same market sending them fund appeals or knocking on their doors, they have no idea exactly what it is that you all do. And adding more groups to the equation may make that just even more confusing. So it's something definitely to, to bear in mind. How often, how many times a month do you open up your Facebook page and see an article about some group that called themselves you know, God's gift to animals in Birmingham, Alabama, and all of, and, and all of a sudden they're, they're being busted by the, the animal care and control or the police or the ASPCA or somebody else because they're, they really are just hoarders wearing, wearing a, a different kind of a mask. We see it constantly. And that brings us all down because if, if I'm Joe Q. Public and I read that article, I'm going to paint you all with the same exact brush. There's this one big brush stroke that's going to happen, and everybody in here is, is just a wacky hoarder. We all know that's not true, so it's really up to us to police ourselves and make sure that we are keeping our own houses in order and keeping them clean. you got some groups who are willing to take in anybody, anytime. They'll take every sick, injured, you know, whatever, healthy, whatever they are, they'll take them. And then you've got others who will only take certain certain elements of that population. So it's really important to know who's doing what so that we're not being redundant and we're being more efficient in the way we function. So the community also, as we've changed, the community expectations of what we do have changed as well. Oftentimes the expectations from your community are not being set by your organization. They're being set by people who, who really are not on the inside, who really are not doing the work. I, I find a, a lot of people use a lot of bluster to kind of distract from, from the mission as opposed to giving kind of credit to the folks who are actually doing the lion's share of the work in their community. So really important. Communication, and nowadays communication happens in such a rapid fire pace that it, it's really easy for somebody to kind of confuse the world and bring you down. For some organizations, let's face it, they can message to, to accomplish different business goals. They may not necessarily be messaging to the public, Joe Q public, um, to promote the mission of their organization as much as they are to raise money. And you know, if, if, you, if, you're, if you don't know any better and you get two fund appeals in the mail on the same day and one of them tells, tells you some sad story about what they're having to do to keep their lights on, and the other one is like, well, we, you know, we're, we're completely no kill and we do this and we do Who are you going to give your money to if you don't know any better? And so I, that's why I think having organizations working together and honoring each other for the role that they play doesn't mean everybody doesn't have a role to play. They just need to work together and honor each other's roles. And then sometimes shelters are victims of their own success. You, we've got organizations who, because they have done a great job, and they've reduced the overpopulation issue in their own communities and they're out there every day pounding the pavement to make things better, they may not have a full shelter. And it's amazing how people will beat you up if, you don't, if, not, if every kennel in your facility is not full. Um, we, uh, we hear that happen all the time. So sometimes we can be kind of victims of our own success. Another good or argument, I guess, for transport of animals in. And then this whole language thing, we talked about that a minute ago, but it's, it, it's really true. Um, I think that the internet and, and social media have, have been both the absolute best of things for our business and, and I guess for the world. 
And then they've also been the absolute worst of things in, in certain ways. You know, when, it's like any other tool. When they're channeled for good and, and people actually use them to accomplish a legitimate mission, then it's kind of hard to argue that it's a good thing. It's not a good thing. But, but when people use them for personal attacks and for, for virtual terrorism and, and all of that, then it becomes a little bit uh, of a different story. Um, just language, the way people talk, the, the words people choose to use are crazy. Have you all heard about this bumper sticker this week? So it, it was late last week, I guess, it actually made the news in, the, in, in New Mexico. This little, um, it's, a, it's actually a private dog training business, um, someplace outside of Albuquerque, I think it is. And they, uh, they had these bumper stickers printed. They're, they're at odds with their animal control department. And so they had bumper stickers printed that say, rehabilitate a dog, euthanize an animal control officer. If that's okay in anybody's book, then I do not want to know that person. Uh, if you're encouraging the killing of somebody for doing their job, it's a little bit like shooting the messenger as well, isn't it? I mean, to, to, blame, to blame all the, e the ills happening in the world around animals on the, the, the folks who are actually trying to do something about it is a little bit crazy. I, my, my dear friend Pam Burns, who was the president of the Hawaiian Humane Society, we lost her several months ago, but Pam, um, Pam once said to me in a meeting, we were, talking about, we were talking about some of these sort of terrorist tactics and some of the, the personal, personal threats and personal attacks. I don't know anybody in this business who has not felt threatened at one point or another by somebody um, over taking a position on something or making a decision that was not popular or whatever, um, or just being. Sometimes all you got to do is be, and, and folks will threaten you. And Pam said to me, you know, blaming an animal shelter for euthanasia is a little bit like blaming the American Cancer Society for cancer. And it's, it, it, that has stuck with me for years and years because I'm thinking, yeah, we're, you know, we, we struggle all day long, every day. And, and I would be willing to bet, how many of you limit your work hours to 40 hours a week? <laughs> really? Wow. I know I do. Oh, wait, that's 40 hours a weekend. So, yeah, it, 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 we, we all put in a lot of extra time and blood, sweat, and tears to try and make this world a better place for animals and the people who care about them and the people who don't care about them, right? I mean, we're, we're trying to help everybody, trying to build communities into better, safer places. And so, you know, if I'm an animal control officer making huge money, I'm sure that rural New Mexico animal control officers make jillions of dollars a year. I'm, I'm driving through town and, I, and I'm behind a vehicle that's got a bumper sticker that's recommending that I be killed. I, I think I'm going to probably go find myself a different line of work. So it's really tough to keep people's morale up and to keep folks excited about our industry when they're taking these personal beatings all the time. And it's not a completely new phenomenon. I, I, I remember threats 35 years ago when I first got into this work, but, but, it's, but it's gotten worse. And I think a lot of that is because, A, we're, we're, we're not a very civil society in general anymore. And B, it's just really easy. Like people can attack you without having to take ownership of it, without having to put their name or their face with it. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's a problem. So just a, a little side note, I actually on Friday reached out to my friends at the Humane Society of the United States, the ASPCA, the National Animal Care and Control Association and American Humane Association and asked if they would be willing to sign a joint statement with me um, about that bumper sticker that we can issue to, to those folks. And we've not only gotten them, but we've gotten some, some interest from organizations like the National Sheriff's Association who want to sign on as well because they're just, we're just tired of the, the baloney. So uh, it's, it's, uh, we've got to stand up, I suppose, and, and really kind of look out for each other. So the other thing that's happened in our industry is that, and, and this is not new, although it is a, a changing trend, we have competition. When it comes to, to folks deciding they want to add a companion animal to their families, we have a lot of competition. The good news is, is that we're gaining on the competition. Things are looking better for us. Every year, the, the, I don't know if you all are familiar with the American Pet Products Association, but it's an amazing organization. It's a pet industry trade group. And they, once a year, they publish this National Pet Owner Survey. They actually go out and survey thousands and thousands of, of folks 
and get their, their takes on pet ownership. So they find out where they're getting their animals, how they're treating their animals, how much money they're spending on their animals, and it's a lot. Um, and so they, they're actually able to really track these trends using real numbers. And uh, the, the last survey I looked at was 1516. And as you can see, a pretty decent percentage of cats and dogs were coming from the shelter. Those numbers are up significantly from what they were even the year before. And if you go back to my early years in sheltering back 30 plus years ago, those numbers were bad. We, we tended to rank like eighth or ninth as a source for companion animals behind a lot of other things. We were behind the pet stores, we were behind the breeders, we were behind the neighbors, we were behind the free to good home ads, we were behind that just showed up on my front porch and I decided to feed it and take it in. We were way down on the list of, as a source. So we've done a good job of marketing ourselves and, and we're, we're no longer the well-kept hidden secret that maybe we used to be. I mean, back. 35 years ago when I got into this, there were a few really nice kind of flagship animal shelters around the country, but most animal shelters, if you went to most communities, the shelter was somewhere near the landfill or an industrial park kind of tucked away and hidden a little bit. Nobody really wanted to live next door to it and all of that. Lollipop Farm is in the suburbs. It's, it's on a beautiful 140 acre parcel of property that was donated. When the last piece of that property became available, um, there was a little house and the last family member lived in it. When she died, we bought that house and converted it into dormitory space for veterinary students from Cornell's externship program to come and stay with us for a couple of weeks. So, um, you know, that's, it's a very different story. We were nowhere near a landfill. <laughs> we were real close to schools and families and happy stuff. So the other thing is I think political correctness has, has, many of us would argue political correctness has gone amok in a lot of ways, but in certain ways it's really served our, our, our missions very well. So, you know, people love to, to, to let, let you know that they rescued their dog, right? You see those bumper stickers, rescued is my favorite breed. I'm like, who did you rescue her from? So. If you go to Lollipop Farm and rescue it from those evil, mean people who are just <laughs> waiting to suck its blood out. And, no. But anyway, people loved, every, every adoption now has a story, right? If you can tell a story when those folks come in to look at that dog or cat, you can convince them that, oh, he had, he's been through this and he's been through that, and, and now all he needs is just the stability of your loving arms, and he will be perfectly fine for the rest of his life. People love it. And if you don't give them that story, they make it up, right? They'll say, they'll say, yeah, he was really abused in his other home. I mean, when I go like this, he goes like this, and I'm like, that doesn't mean he was abused. It just means he's intelligent. <laughs> it doesn't matter. If they want to make up a story, knock yourself out. It's excellent. And then I think we've also kind of changed our way of doing business in a lot of ways, this whole notion of open adoptions. I mean, when I first got, when I first got into this 35 years ago, you didn't even ask questions. Like people came in, they had the money, they filled out this like 97 page contract that we had no intention of enforcing because we had no money or time or people to do it. But we convinced them that they were signing away their lives and if they didn't comply, then we would come after them and take their children away and <laughs> all that stuff. And then we switched from that to making them fill out an application. And the application morphed into basically an FBI interrogation. Um, and we got to the point where nobody was worthy of adoption, right? I mean, we were like, whoa, no, I'm sorry. You've got children under the age of six. They must not have a puppy. And it's like, who else wants a puppy, right? So we, uh, we, we sort of, I think we've kind of, this pendulum has swung back a little bit more towards the middle and we've realized that we have to be reasonable. We have to expect, a, 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 anticipate that most people coming into your facility looking to, to adopt an animal are there for the right reasons. Most of them are not Satanists coming in for a sacrifice cat, <laughs> right? I mean, I come from an era when we used, to, we used to hide all the black cats at a Halloween for a month because we just knew that everybody who came in to adopt a black cat was wanting to, you know, take it out into the woods and do a sacrifice ritual. And yeah, I, I, we never saw it happen, but we heard about it a lot. And so I'm pretty sure it was happening. We just didn't catch them. So we've come a long way from that. And now we realize that, you know, well, there, there's that whole no pets as gifts at Christmas time, right? That's the way it was. In my day, we had t-shirts that said, pets are for life, not just for Christmas judgy. 
And, and now we realize that, you know, after actually doing some surveys and studying that issue, that those pets that are given as gifts often stick better. There's a lower return rate. They tend to stick in the home better than pets that people have made, done all the research and thought about for weeks and have come in and lied on our applications and everything. <laughs> So it's, it's really not necessarily such a bad thing. So now we have shelters who are delivering puppies to people's houses on Christmas Eve so that their kids can wake up to the puppy. That's, that's kind of a shift. It's kind of a shift in thinking. I like it. So the other thing that we're doing is preserve, trying to preserve families and preserve the bond. You know, we, we, I think we were probably early on were part of the problem because we made it so easy for people just to sort of take the most drastic possible action when they were having a problem with the pet in their household, right? All they had to do is just say, you know what? This cat has peed on the couch one too many times. Off to the, the, off to the shelter he goes. And we thought that, that was great because that was better than taking him out to the country and dumping him on the side of the road, which we know people did and still do. Um, probably not in the volume that we thought, but, but nonetheless, it, it, it happened. Um, and we didn't really do a whole lot other than just sort of judge them when they brought their animals in. They'd leave and we'd say, no, 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 no. What we realize is that maybe there's some things that we can do proactively to support those people and those families so that they can actually keep those animals in the household. Maybe we give them the tools that they need. Maybe it's, a, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about in a minute is this whole access to veterinary care issue, which is, is a big issue. It's a huge issue in our world and in our, in our movement. And so I would argue that probably the single largest reason for folks bringing animals into shelters nowadays is because they can't afford to keep them. You know, they take them to the vet. They find out what the bill's going to be to fix something that needs to be fixed. They can't afford it, and they just bring them in. So what if we ha actually have a service where we can help them out with, the, with those veterinary expenses or if we can help them out with the behavior problem that, that exists that, that's solvable if, you just, if you're willing to put a little bit of effort into it. So that, that's sort of the idea is kind of to build in safety net so that we're actually helping people out instead of just taking their animals off of their hands and then what are we going to do with them? Then we go back to that place where we're overpopulated again, and we, 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 we have no more homes than they, than they could find on their own. So a little bit on this access to care issue. I think that it, what, what we, we finally have realized, we finally kind of have opened our eyes and realized that this is not a, just an animal welfare issue, that access to affordable veterinary care is also a social welfare issue. You know, families are being torn apart because they can't afford... The, the animal's a luxury. And nobody in, in, in this room or in any other room could convince me that that dude on the right is not as entitled and deserving of having that love and companionship as that lady on the left. You'd never convince me of that. I, I think he probably needs it more than she does. And so I, I think it's really important that we figure out how can we bridge that gap? How can we make sure that we, let, that we help people make that bond even stronger instead of just saying, nope, sorry, bond is severed. We're going to take the animal and hopefully find another home for it with somebody who's more worthy than you are. Um, we saw major judgy behavior after Hurricane Katrina, and which was, well, let's face it, Hurricane Katrina was a seminal event in our industry as a whole. I mean, it changed a lot about the way we think and the way we do things. But one of the things that happened after Katrina was, immediately after Katrina, is that suddenly tons of judgy people from our industry showed up in, in Louisiana to help. And they were, they were literally stealing people's animals and judging them because they had left animals behind in a situation where they were at risk of losing their lives and their children's lives. And because the, the government did a really lousy job of helping people get from, from, uh, from danger to safety. And they definitely weren't going to take their pets if they, if they loaded them up on a bus or whatever and got them out of there. But then we have these people come in and, and they're hesitant to give these animals back because, well, he left them. So obviously he's, he's not a good pet owner and doesn't love these animals. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's easy to say when you're, when you're sitting someplace else and not sitting in their shoes where they're having to cut holes in their roofs and climb out to save themselves because their house is flooded up to the third floor 
That's a, that's a really different set of circumstances. But we, we saw judginess even then. There were, there were lots of stories from, from folks that I knew who were there. Who, you know, there were people who were in their homes sitting at their table having dinner, and suddenly somebody bust their door open to rescue the dog because they saw the dog in the window, and they assumed the dog was in there by itself and had been abandoned. What? So it's like, were there not enough real problems without having to go down and invent more problems? So we've got to get beyond the judgy and, and really get to the place where we're doing things to support those bonds. They are really, really important. We all know that. We all know the benefit. I mean, we're all crazy, right? We're all insane animal people. I will own it to the day I die. Everybody in my life knows it. It's, uh, there's, it, it is no secret. I have been completely wide open about it forever. I live with five dogs, a 28-year-old macaw, and a 28-year-old quarter horse. So I don't remember a time in my life when, when the humans in my house have not been drastically outnumbered. So if there ever is an uprising of the companion animal, we are goners. <laughs> but that bill's getting our way, right? I mean, and even us, right? Even us. I mean, most of us are probably relatively comfortable. We're all probably relatively like middle class. You would think that we would be in a, in a, in a safer place. But even, even, uh, even folks in, like us struggle. So imagine how folks who have nothing or who are living at, at subsistence level are able to actually support themselves, much less support, you know, the first time something bad goes, goes wrong. And it doesn't even have to be anything that bad, right? I mean, I, I took my yellow lab, Sam, who is 12 years old, to the vet last summer. They cleaned his teeth. They found a little tumor on his jaw. Of course, that turned into a referral to a, a veterinary dental specialist who is one of like 18 people in the universe who know what she knows. Um, and we all, like you're all hearing, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. <laughs> and so I drag Sam over to her and she looks at it and she's like, oh yes, we can operate on this. I think we can do it and still save part of his jaw. And I, you know, you don't want to even ask, you don't want to say, really, what does, what's that going to cost me? Like, because you're thinking, it's Sam and I love Sam and Sam loves me. And, and I, I, the last thing I want to do is, is make a, a decision based on money with Sam. He's my child, I can't do that. But I'm like, so how much? And she said, well, it's going to be anywhere from four to 6,000. And I'm like, this is a 12 year old obese Labrador retriever who probably is going to, something else is going to get him before jaw cancer does, is my guess. What did I do? I scraped together fourth grand and had half of his jaw cut out um, so that he wouldn't, he wouldn't die of jaw cancer. So, and now he, 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 his jaw is, he never missed a meal, by the way. <laughs> very important to note, we got home that very afternoon when a big hunk of his jaw had been taken out and there were stitches, like 40 stitches along the, the, the top of his jawline, and he ate. <laughs> and he didn't just eat, he ate like a Labrador retriever. He, she said, be sure and soften the kibble. And I'm like, are you sure? Because I don't think it matters. <laughs> so just a little bit on sort of where we are headed, I think, as an industry, and where certainly our association is headed on this whole access to care issue. Um, back in January, the, the American Veterinary Medical Association's House of Delegates met. And, um, oops, sorry. One of the things that they, uh, that they recommended was that there be a resolution that the ABMA staff actually work directly with our association to, to, to develop sort of models for care, to really look at what are the models for care that, that could make veterinary care accessible to at least almost everybody. How can we, maybe, maybe it's a matter of saying, you know what, it doesn't always have to be the gold standard. You get it, if, if my dog breaks his leg, maybe a really good splint is, is, is good enough. Maybe he doesn't need surgery and pins and screws and hooks and whatever. So um, that may be part of it. I don't know. I don't know exactly what this is going to look like. And we've just barely sort of started the conversation. But the cool thing is, is that at the very highest level of the veterinary profession and one of the highest levels of the animal welfare profession, we're having serious conversation about how to bridge this gap and make this better. We, our, our, my board of directors back in March had a collaboration summit with the board of directors of, of the VMAE, Veterinary Medical Association Executives. You guys familiar with them? That's the, that's the organization that is made up of, of leaders of state VMAs. So the people that they represent 
are the folks in the trenches actually delivering veterinary services every day. Um, that's kind of who we are too. Our members are folks in the trenches doing the work every day. So it seemed to make sense that we have, we, the way we work together, the way we work with, with our members is very similar. So maybe we should talk about working with each other. And we've come up with sort of a, we're a, at least the outline for a white paper that we're getting ready to release that really talks about what our priorities are gonna be as two leaders in the, in the, the field all of whom are animal welfare professionals, right? Veterinarians think of themselves as animal welfare professionals and so do we. So we're, we're really all in the same boat. We look at things maybe a little differently. And so what we're gonna do is explore where's the common ground, where are the differences and how can we deal with those and, and get them out of the way so that we can really work on the things that we have in common, things that we're all interested in. And I think, you know, get, giving more people access to veterinary care for their pets is something we can all wrap our arms around and get excited about. And then at the local level everywhere, there are tons of examples where vets and shelters are working really effectively together. Unfortunately, there's still lots of places where they fight too much, but we're, we're chipping away at that. So all that collaboration is great, but it's really money that talks and makes things happen in our world. I, it, we, it's, it's sometimes tough to admit, especially when you spent your whole life in a mission-based organization and your whole focus has been on, on achieving a mission and your mission is more than just the bottom line. But the bottom line matters. And if we don't have the resources to do what we want to do, then we're not going to get it done. It's just that simple. So at the University of Tennessee, we, um, we have a program in our College of Social Work, oddly enough, that is headed up by a veterinarian uh, Dr. Michael Blackwell, and Michael is, he started a program through the Social Work College called the, the Program for Pet Health Equity. And what he's trying to do is really explore um, access to veterinary care as a social welfare issue and concern for us across the country. And so uh, our friends at Maddie's Fund just awarded him $2.8 million to do a study to really to kind of get, put, put some numbers to this and really get his arms around where we are so that we can figure out ways to solve that problem. He's a, he's a brilliant man. He was the dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine at UT for a long time. He has been on our side of the business. He's worked in animal welfare um, on occasion. He ran Humane Society University for the HSUS for a period of time. Um, but this is really his, his passion and kind of his calling in life. So. Um, like I said, it's great that we can all work together, but if we can work together and have $2.8 million to support that work, we're gonna get done a little bit quicker, right? <laughs> so we won't talk a lot about this because you guys are probably already familiar, plenty familiar with it, but looking at these models for managing intake, you know, that's another trend. I think we've moved, a lot of shelters have moved from open admission to at least managing admission where they're, they're scheduling the intake so they can kind of control their inventory a little bit better. I think the main thing is, no matter what model you follow, is to make sure that you're looking at ways to, to also support those animals in their households and to try and keep them out of your system altogether, if that's doable. So funding is, is kind of, uh, as we just talked about, is a big deal and something we always need to think about. One thing we find is that the average cost of care for animals we're dealing with has gone up because they're not Bichons, right? Where, with those, those dogs aren't coming in so much anymore, and if they do, they're gone so fast that you haven't really ever spent much or had to think a whole lot about it. Um, there, there's a majorly quick turnaround there. Length of stay is a big driver in, in terms of the outcomes for everything we do, including the way we spend our money. And when, when most of the animals you're seeing are, are pit bull types, or as Roger Haston, my friend from PetSmart Charities, calls it, blocky-headed whatevers, um, they tend to stay a little bit longer. And, and, uh, and not only they, but then you, know, you, you get all kinds of animals with behavior problems or medical problems or, or because they're old or because they're too young or whatever it is where they're having to stick with you. They're, they're, they're difficult to place. Again, it's kind of like adoptable. We still don't know exactly what difficult to place means. And it's driven a lot by the resources you have available um, in, in your organization. But we, uh, it, by, by, by doing this, we're seeing revenue from adoptions falling. We're, we don't have as many adoptable animals, so we're not collecting as much revenue that way. So we've got to make it up somehow. And one of the ways organizations are doing that is through um, having high quality veterinary care available through their shelters, which causes some tension between 
animal welfare in the veterinary community in some places. So we all know that historically we didn't fix a lot of stuff because we couldn't. We talked about this a minute ago. Now, because we're dealing with fewer animals and because that difficult to place definition is a moving target, we find ourselves doing a lot of this stuff. Larimer Humane Society in Fort Collins, Colorado just built a new shelter. They have an entire room in their clinic dedicated to doing dentals. That's all they do is dentals on all of the, the, the old dogs that come in that need it. They're doing dentals for other organizations, rescue groups and whatnot in their community. And they've got animals cycling through there constantly. It's silly that you know animals are, are losing their lives because their teeth need to be cleaned. So they're, they're fixing all of that stuff. So one thing that has kind of changed, when I first got into this, we didn't get along real well with the veterinarians in our community. And we've seen that improve dramatically. And a lot of the reason for that, I think, is because we have figured out that we actually are not always at odds with each other. We actually can be partners in making things better. Um, so shelters in many communities are great clients, right? Especially if you're a specialty practice. And the shelter, shelters get all kinds of crazy stuff, right? I mean, we, I used to, when we did the externship program at Lollipop with Cornell, we, the way we sold it um, to the, the higher-ups at Cornell was, your students are going to be exposed to more crap in two weeks at our shelter than they may be exposed to in a lifetime private practice. So it's, it's really a, a fascinating environment for them. But we're also a client for a lot of them. We're a major referral source. And I think we, 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 didn't, we haven't really capitalized on that, you know? I mean, if, if my shelter is adopting out 7,500, 8,000 animals a year, every one of those animals is being sent to a veterinarian somewhere. Um, and, and, you know, if I'm the veterinarian, then I want a piece of that action because that could be a 15-year relationship that I have with a new client. So really, we're, we're, we're great sources of business for, for most veterinarians. And then... You know, we're keeping more animals alive and getting them out. We're taking animals that, that used to be in that category that would have been euthanized that are now not, and we're putting them back together again when they're broken. Um, and the more animals we keep alive and send out to a vet, the better, off for, the, better the vet's business is, for sure. They'll need, they'll need more appointments throughout the years. So we did, I'm not going to spend too much, we don't have a lot of time, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I've got a few slides, but we, we did a survey asking a bunch of questions, really kind of looking at the evolution of the field. And um, one of the things we asked was, do you expect adoptions to continue to be a primary focus for your organization? And oddly enough, we were kind of surprised, almost 64% of those folks said, yes, it will be. And I, I'm thinking... You know, a lot of folks that I talk to say they already are, are running low on animals available for adoption, and they're fo t changing their focus to things like, you know, more cruelty investigations or, or, or all these preventative things that we've been talking about. So that kind of surprised me that that was the response. Again, this was not scientific. It was nationwide, so it may have been a little bit skewed in certain regions and, and uh, you know, by the folks who answered the question. This is, doesn't surprise anybody that most difficult to place dogs are behaviorally challenged, the pit bull types, and medically challenged. It's, that, that's not really any, any great, I'm sure, shakes for any of you. Um, cat intake is declining nationally. Do we think that trend is going to continue? And um, most, most folks are, are not confident that that's going to happen. I think that's because probably a lot of the responders to this haven't seen it happening in their own communities yet. Um, hopefully it will if we continue doing the work we're doing. Um, this is just basically about, about folks who have reached that, have kind of crossed the brink. If you've reached that point where you're no longer having to even think about euthanasia for space, um, it, you know, the, it, the, these, are, these are some of the, this just gives you an idea of who's gotten there and how in terms of their organization, the community as a whole, and their entire state or, or province or region. We, this, was, this, was, this was done in Canada as well. It was, it was sent out nationwide in, in the U.S. and Canada. Again, nothing, nothing that's a huge surprise. What we did find was that a lot of folks really felt, felt like their organizations were well ahead of the game, but their communities and their regions were still not. So, interesting stuff. If you're at the brink, um, what, are you, what, what do you think you need to be doing to help those, the rest of the folks who are not there yet get there? And the big things are to assist with transport, provide supplies, provide training and assistance. And then on the other side of it, this was the folks who are not, have not yet reached that brink. What do you need from other organizations? One thing we found is that transport alone is not enough. 
You need to really partner with those other organizations and provide them with additional services to try and help them cut off the supply, ultimately. Some of these are, it's just a lot of words on a sheet, so I'm, I'll, I, you, you can read those later. It's not, it's not that important to this conversation. These are some of the questions that I think are still out there and still outstanding, and some of the questions we're going to be having to look at hard over the next 10 years or so. For cats, you know, we, we know that in many communities we've achieved a really great, we're in a great place with dogs in general, but in a lot of places cats are still overpopulated and are, and, and are still a, a dilemma and a challenge to deal with. So which strategies are working and which are not, and how can they be tweaked or changed to work better? Things like um, trap, neuter, return, return to field, all the different, there's a gazillion different strategies for managing those, those populations of cats. What's the real impact of free roaming cats on wildlife? Depends on who you ask right now. If you ask wildlife people, it's in the billions. If you ask cat people, it's three. Um, <laughs> so we all know that the truth is somewhere in the middle. So let's really get our arms around that and figure out. I think, you know, not only do we need to be thinking in terms of the numbers of, of wild animals that are, that are injured and killed by cats, but we need to think about their suffering too. Right? I mean, if, if, if a, a, thousand hamps, or a thousand rats are being killed by cats in a, in a community, um, just as a number, how much are they suffering? We, we see rabbits and birds brought into rehabbers all the time with terrible, painful injuries that have been inflicted by cats. We can't even just ignore that. We're animal well if we're, if we're going to call ourselves animal welfare people, then we can't just ignore that suffering. We've got to think about that suffering just like we think about the number of animals that are killed. For dogs, what are we going to do about placing those difficult to place dogs? We're seeing dogs staying way too long in shelters. That seems to be the trend because they're, they're, they're not as easy to place. You know, those Bichons are flying out the door, um, but, but the, uh, the eight-year-old pit bull with three legs is not flying out the door. So what do we do to get those dogs placed as well? As we see this overpopulation situation, even in the South, start to decline, and we reach a place where we have a balance between supply and demand, and then we get an imbalance of supply and demand, where we have more of a demand than we have supply. What, where are those dogs of the future going to come from? Are we going to have some? Are we, as an industry, going to have some role in regulating responsible breeding to make sure that it's done well? Because I don't think we can fool ourselves into thinking folks are going to stop wanting dogs just because we don't have them. Right? They're going to still want them, and they're going to get them somewhere. So we, 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 it would be really easy. I, I look at how much progress we've made in 35 years. I think it would take way less than 35 years for us to backslide right back to where we were if we're not careful about the way we manage the changing, um, the changing horizon here. And then as an industry as a whole, how do we reinvent ourselves to continue to be relevant and to continue working towards our missions? I think looking at things like expanding our cruelty investigations programs, being the leaders and bridging that gap in, in terms of access to veterinary care, um, you know, continuing with things like transport and helping out folks who aren't where we are. If you've achieved a high level of success, until everybody has achieved that high level of success, we're not there yet. We can maybe say we've won a battle, but we haven't won the war until everybody is there. And there's still a big old country out there, and there's still a lot of problems. We've always said, I, I've, I've kind of laughed about this, because back in the early years, we used to use this all the time in speeches. We talk about how we're the only industry in the world that's trying to put itself out of business. Well, is that really true? Are we trying to put ourselves out of business? Or do we need to just start thinking about working smarter and collaborating more and consolidating organizations so that instead of having four big management structures, we have one? and that management structure covers a broader geographic area. I don't know, there's a lot of stuff there to think about. But I, and, and collaboration and working together is really huge. Finally, I told you the shameless plug, that's our email address. Um, again, you will not be allowed out of the room until you have signed up. Now, I really would love for you all to go visit the website and consider becoming members. Our real strength as an association, we're kind of like, I, 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 you guys are familiar with the American Dental Association because that's been used on, in, in commercials for toothpaste forever, like four out of five dentists recommend. That's the American Dental Association. We are the American Dental Association for this industry. So our strength is really in the, the, the network and the partnerships that we have. I, uh, I jumped into this field without a clue as to what I was doing 
And uh, 35 years later, I've got a whole bunch of friends across this crazy country and, and beyond that I know I can count on to help me. If I've got a question, if I've got a problem, I, I, I reach out and these folks respond. We have two Facebook groups that are closed only to members. And you, you go into those groups and post a question, you're going to start getting feedback almost in, immediately. So it's a great way to share beyond your own local network. It's really easy in this field for us to start feeling kind of alone, like an island wherever you happen to be. But there's a great big industry out there that's there to support you for you to sign up and take advantage of it. So that's the end of my sales pitch. Thank you very much. That's my contact information. So feel free. That's my mobile number and my email address. Feel free to jot those down or just you'll, you can download the presentation later and look at those and feel free to, to call on me anytime. That's literally what I'm here for is to, to help support you as leaders in the field to make this a, a, a better world for animals and for their people. So thank you very much.